We thank you, Lord, for the word that you give to us this day. May your word speak to our hearts. We praise your name. So my friends, um, in that first reading it speaks about Cyrus being anointed. and He was a pagan king, but he had, was being used by God for God's purposes to bring his, the people of Israel back to Jerusalem. But we have been anointed by God through our baptism. And you must go away from this place with a deeper appreciation of the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon you and of the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon our whole community. Through our baptism, we have been claimed by God. We have been made sons and daughters of God heirs of the kingdom and through our baptism we, and confirmation we have been empowered from on high to be proclaimers of the good news of Jesus for the sake of the church in today's world which is in such crisis and for the sake of the world itself which is in deeper crisis. I want this to be, as it were, a graduation ceremony for all of us because today you have been granted from the Lord himself a PhD. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> That's a ministry in preaching, healing and deliverance. <laughs> So congratulations. <laughs> there is an urgency in today's world for you to exercise your PhD. Don't hide it under a bushel. Now in today's world there's a lot of misunderstandings and one of those comes from actually today's Gospel where there are people who think that when Jesus said render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. That means that those who are in public life and those who have, take care of the public sphere of things in the society can do as they will. Because, well, that's their responsibility. God's responsibility to do with the church and all those churchy things. That's exactly what it does not mean. But that's how it's often interpreted. Jesus' answer to the Pharisees was very shrewd. Because yes, it's good to pay taxes to Caesar. To render to Caesar what is Caesar's in that regard. But when he says render to God what is God's, that's everything. That's every world leader. That's every potentate of any kind and that's every person in the world. And all things and all plans and all purposes that we undertake, it's all under the authority of the one God who is unrivaled in his majesty. So our thinking can get somewhat confused in today's situation. And this is what we proclaim. From the very beginning, when the disciples had encountered the risen Lord, that encounter was so dramatic in their personal lives and as a little community that they knew they could confront the Roman Empire in all its might and strength and power because they knew they had been given a power from on high, a resurrection power, 
They knew they could proclaim the truth that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus of Nazareth, who hung on a cross, condemned as a criminal by human beings, was raised by the Father, proved to be the Son of God, and now the Lord of all, who has put all things under his feet. You see, and this is very important because the, the word that they used for Lord was kurios in Greek. And in those days, people were required to proclaim that Caesar is Lord and bow down before Caesar. And so they drag an effigy of Caesar into a local village and call the people forward and the soldiers would say, bow before the effigy and burn incense. And those who are not prepared to do that stand over here. And they went to the lions. The choices in the early church were rather dramatic, weren't they? But our choices today are dramatic too. Because it's just as urgent in today's situation, with such confusion, such disorder, such chaos in the world, it's so important that we go forth and with a clear mind and a fired heart to proclaim the truth that Jesus is Lord, that he is curious. Just out there, there's a a statue of St. Benedict that this place is dedicated to. And underneath it you might find it said, here is St. Benedict, the builder of civilization. What a thing to say. He's the patron saint of Europe. Why? Because during the Dark Ages when the barbarians came down and marauded uh, the whole Christian church, and, and society seemed to be upside down, Benedict formed communities. Communities of the Benedictine monks who spread throughout the whole of Europe and retained the faith in its purity and the values of the kingdom of God and stood for it. And so we are now in another Benedictine era, this age. And this community, in God's purposes, is, is similar to the one that Benedict formed many years ago, in the 5th century. In the same sort of dark age, the barbarians are everywhere, as it were. We don't call them barbarians, of course, but, um, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I'm not likely to confront my local politician and call him a barbarian, but... <laughs> but it is barbaric! What's going on? And we are called to be a light in the darkness. Not in arrogance, but in truth. In humbly standing in total dependence upon the living God and proclaiming the truth that there is one Lord. And his name is Jesus. And it's what the, Paul proclaims in the Philippians, that he humbled himself unto death on the cross, but God the Father raised him from the dead and gave him the name which is above every other name. So now, in heaven and earth and the underworld, every knee will bow and proclaim, every tongue will proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what we stand for. That's what we live for. That's what we're prepared to die for because we know it's the truth. And we will claim the territory. It will be the Lord who claims it, but we'll simply be his instruments. It will be a battle beyond anything that we can imagine that's ahead of us. But by the grace of God, we will stand firm and strong in proclaiming the truth. So that we, in our age, will build a culture, a new civilization of life and love. I remember John Paul II, in that beautiful preaching he gave at the 
Canadian World Youth Day in Toronto. It was just after the darkness had come into the world from 9-11 and all that's consequently come from that. And he said to the young people, you must make a choice. You can choose to go for darkness, which means violence and hatred and bitterness and resentment, or you can choose to go for love and truth and holiness that is found in the cross of Jesus Christ. You can choose to claim the power of the resurrection of Christ in your lives. He said, make that choice and rebuild, build a civilization of life and love, you know, brick by brick. And that's what we're doing in building community. And we're rebuilding from, from ground up, from ground zero, as it were, up. Because that's God's purpose in today's world. And so he's bestowing on us charisms, not for ourselves, but for the sake of the evangelization that he's called us to. Because when we are sent to proclaim, under the grace of your PhD, right? When you're sent to proclaim, it will not only be in words. The words are important. The words must speak the truth in love. <clears throat> but it will also be in signs that will accompany the words. We noticed in the second reading from St. Paul, when he's talking to his beloved Thessalonians, and this is the first letter that Paul probably wrote, the, one, the first one that we have available to us anyway. And he says this, We know, brothers, that God loves you and that you've been chosen. Take hold of that. God loves you and you have been chosen. You have been anointed for a purpose. And when the good news came to you, it came not only as words, but as power, and as the Holy Spirit, and as utter conviction. So we are to bring the good news, not only with words, but with power. The Greek word is dunamis, power, which is the power of God from on high, shown through healings, miracles, deliverance, through raising from the dead. The power of God is meant to accompany the proclamation of the word and that gives it its power. Again and again in the scriptures we see that. We see it in uh, the Acts of the Apostles especially. And I don't intend to go too long here so I just want to mention a couple of places though. Remember when Philip came down to Samaria and we're told that he preached the word. But then there were signs and wonders accompanying the word that gave it its authority. And people saw the word of God in action. And this, I think, is important for us to, um, to take hold of. And, and, to realize that God too in these days is doing a new move of his Holy Spirit because of the urgency of the times, because we're very similar to the early church, the word will sound cheap to the ears of people today unless it's accompanied by signs. It says the people united in welcoming the message that Philip preached either because they'd heard of the miracles he worked or because they saw them themselves. That's what brought them to faith. There were many unclean spirits that came shrieking out of many who were possessed and several paralytics and cripples were cured. All of this was a sign for people, a visible sign of the kingdom of God breaking in. This is what God wants to do in these days. Right around the world now, there's a new move of the Spirit happening of this kind. In Mark's Gospel, it says, Jesus himself says, oh, sorry, uh, Mark says about, about the early Christians, he says, while 
Jesus went, returned to the right hand of God and while they, they went out preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word by the signs that accompanied it. So they were preaching everywhere, but then it was confirmed by the word, uh, by the signs that accompanied it. That's what God wants to do in these days. When Paul spoke to the Corinthians, he said, I, I didn't come to you of any philosophy. I didn't come with great words of, 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 of wisdom. He said, I only came with Jesus. And I preached Jesus. And it was Jesus crucified that I preached. And he says, that's why you had such a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Whenever we preach Jesus crucified, whenever we preach Jesus is Lord, the Spirit will witness to the truth of what's being proclaimed by bringing signs and wonders of one kind or another. It's what the Lord wants to do in our time. And it's like, yes, with the power and the Holy Spirit and other conviction. There needs to be an utter conviction in our own hearts <clears throat> that we really believe in the truth of who Jesus is. And then the utter conviction that the Spirit will bring to our listeners and open their hearts up in a new way and convince them of the truth of who Jesus is. That he is Lord! And they'll bow down before him. That's our dream. That's our purpose. That's why he has made us into a community. That's why we, have, we are church. We are church for the sake of the mission. Because there aren't enough people yet who can really proclaim that Jesus is Lord, who believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead and confess with the lips that Jesus is Lord. That's where salvation comes from, Paul tells us. So let's pray for that, that we will have that fire in us and let's go from this place with real resolution. That there's a new move of the Spirit. You know, when I was in Rome, uh, Damien Staines, who has a whole ministry of evangelization, very powerful ministry, told this wonderful story about a group who were moving about in London. And they just move, move about the, the city, just praying with people or just talking to people about Jesus, that sort of thing. And um, they were near one of the major stations one day. And there was a man there in a wheelchair. And so, one of the guys felt really moved to actually pray with this fellow and ask him what he would like to be prayed with. And, and so they went up to him and said, look, would you like us to pray for you? And he said, yes, that would be nice. So they began to pray with him. And as they began to pray, he began to manifest an evil spirit. It was screaming and shouting and everything like that. And so it was such a disturbance that the people around, there's lots of people around who didn't know what was going on, they called the police. And, but thankfully, by the time the police arrived, the, the demons had, been, had gone, and the guy was up out of the wheelchair, walking and jumping and praising God. <laughs> and the police said, what's happening here? What's happening here? He said, I've just been set free. <laughs> so praise God, all in God's timing. But whatever the Lord, we need to move under the Spirit. And Tim's trying to call us to that, that deep um, walk of the Spirit. And I'm hearing that in my own heart too, that we need to again open up to the new Pentecost experience. Again allow the Spirit to take us deeper. And allow the Spirit to give us the promptings, to receive the promptings that he gives us. So that we can take, go forward in the Spirit's power. And I pray for that for myself, I pray for the whole community, that, that we will be more imbued with the Spirit of God, more alive with the Holy Spirit, more led by the Spirit, guided and directed, and that the ministry that we enter into will be so much more empowered, because there's so many unbelievers, so many people who just need to see the witness that can come through the power of God at work. Undergirding it all, of course, is our witness as a community and as brothers and sisters in the Lord. That will convince people most. But right out there, at the very beginning, they certainly need to have that preaching of the word, that healing, that deliverance work. Uh, so let's thank God that he's given us our PhDs. Let's put them into work. Praise his name.